Hello everyone, welcome to part two. If you haven't seen it, the part one, I'll put the link above so you can check that out. But we're talking about this Vertex pipeline, what I'm calling the V pipeline here. Today we're gonna do a bit of a deeper dive just explaining how it works and maybe how you can use it. Before we get into that though, I do wanna share one thing. I would say in near record time, probably within 10 minutes of posting my video, uh, someone named Rough Edge Barb actually pointed out to me that even though GLTF doesn't support UDIMs, you know, uh, internally, you know, they were just saying like, well, forget about all that. Just look at the UVs. If the UVs are outside the zero to one range, if they're in the one to two range or three to four, whatever, you can use that and kind of floor that number and use that as an index to select either different colors in your palette or metal values in your palette. Um, so I did talk about this a little bit in the intro video. But basically with the add-on, there's a palette of colors here, and then there's a palette of metal values. And here's the original UV map. And this is not the UV for the trim sheet. So we will talk about the trim sheet later. This is the UV map just for like the noise and scratch selection, right? So it has a unique face map to the, to the surface of the object. But then there's a button here that allows you to map the UVs. And when you map the UVs, it actually displaces them by units of tiles. So it could be, for instance, if we look at the color palette, right? The orange color is actually the first color in the palette. So if we select these two, these orange faces, they will all exist within that first tile on the X axis. So if you're looking at the X axis going forward, it's actually on tile zero. Um, if we look at the purple one here, right? So if we look at the purple, purple is actually the next tile over. It's the first one. So the metal values work the same, right? Um, there's a metal palette you can see, and the red one actually is the shiny metal. So if we click on this guy, and maybe we can do a different visualization. We can actually visualize using um, using vertex colors. This vertex color set, which is now on metal, um, you can see the values. So in the color palette, the red one is the first one, and then the green one is kind of the third one. So we have things that are in the first tile, zero, looking vertically, right? So the metal tile is on the zero tile here, and then this is actually zero, one, two. So this is actually the second, the third tile, but index two, right? So the metal color, and then I believe the gloss plastic is this one. So you can vertex paint however you want. I did provide some utilities. So for instance, let's say we just want to completely, you know, wipe this away and, and do this again. We can actually come in here, uh, select a color, and we can select everything and then just hit paint vertex colors. And that's going to paint all the colors. Um, you know, we could do purple. We can do individual faces as well, as well right? So if we want this to be orange, we can certainly just hit paint there to get that orange. The same idea with metal, right? So if you hit metal and I don't know, let's say we want it to be all, um, we'll select everything first and we want it to be shiny metal. This is what it would look like if the whole thing was super shiny metal. Same thing with painted and gloss plastic and then matte plastic, right? So you can kind of pick between those different uh, presets. And just to explain how they work, they're driven by the color palette. So. The red channel, I believe, is the metal. So on matte plastic, the metal value is zero, and then the roughness is 0.7. And so before, what I did kind of in the demo was I uh, kind of selected all these guys and then made this shiny, I think. Right, so that's gonna make that shiny. And maybe we had this shiny as well. That's the basic workflow. Um, like I said, the add-on probably could use a lot of work. But the idea is that you only have a couple different types of materials anyways. So using a discrete palette should, should really make sense. I think next we should just look through the color attributes and talk about what they're doing. If we go to like the solid shading type, then we can actually hit a checkbox here that allows us to look at the attribute, which is the color attribute, which is kind of useful for just debugging this. Um, so this is actually the color that we're painting. And these are those metal values that I mentioned. So when you look at these, the metal palettes down here, that's where these colors come from. Ambient inclusion uh, is just a baked property. So I'll just show you how to bake it. It's really not too difficult. So we make sure we're in cycles here. We scroll down and we go to bake and we can just bake the ambient occlusion map. Um, we are gonna have the target be the active color attribute. So it's gonna bake it right to the vertex data. So we can go ahead and bake that. It doesn't really take very long. Um, and then we see this is what we get. Um, because all the data is face corner data, all of these vertices are kind of split from one another. So that's why you get these really nice transitions on the, the occlusion data. Um, it's, just, it's just a workflow that's, that's been working really well. Baking the edge mask is a little bit tricky. I do have a material built in here where it's called curvature. And if you go into the viewport shading or the rendered shading, we can actually see a preview of what this would look like. 
once again, you got to make sure you're in cycles. The way it works is that it's actually uh, using the emission channel, which is kind of a trick that you can use in Blender to, to bake whatever you want. And we get the pointiness from the geometry. So that's kind of the key insight there that you can get curvature data out of Blender, but you have to grab the pointiness and then you kind of tune it with all these other values. Um, this is probably too aggressive just by, you know, I've experimented with this a little bit now, so I know what I'm looking for, but you can use this color ramp to kind of see what kind of uh, mask you want. And just remember that this edge mask is basically going to be used for your procedural wear and tear. So you don't want it to be like too hyper crazy because it's going to come through really strong. Maybe you want something like this. And then just for argument's sake, if we add a new color, um, a color attribute, we can bake to this pretty easily. So we go back up here to render, come down to bake and go to emission. Same thing. You're going to set the target to active color attribute and just bake it. What we can do now to preview this is if we come back to this mode, uh, we need to make sure that we're in attribute here. So it was in material, but now we're in attribute and we can see all of our um, colors here. This is the edge mask we just baked. Okay. So this might not even be strong enough. If you look at the one that I actually had, it's actually a little bit stronger. That's kind of where I liked it. So you do need to play with that, play with these color ramps and as well as the gamma to try to try to tune that color mask. So there is a geometry node that I've baked into this. It's called color converter. So really it's just a couple of configurations here. You have to set the out color to be color. Um, I think the way I've coded it, this is hard coded right now. So this color attribute here ends up being the master color attributes, the one that we bake the other things into. But basically you're gonna have your ambient occlusion, which we just talked about, right? So that's here, it's a named attribute and ambient occlusion. So that actually pulls from this guy. Um, and then we have a edge mask named attribute. These are kind of hard coded right now. We could expose these as parameters, but it's kind of just more configuration. But yeah, so we can take a look at the preview of that. So if we look at color, this is what the combined AO and edge mask look like. And then of course we do have an Uber shader here as well um, that kind of previews this for us. So if we go into material preview, then we actually get a preview of the, of the thing that we're making. And you have to remember the way that the colors and the metal values are encoded are basically in the UV locations. So the shader in game is going to be actually using, pulling these from an index to actually color it. But in our shader here, we're straight up plugging in the metal value as well as the color value, metal X and color X is what I'm calling them. Um, but it gives you like a preview of what this would look like. Like I said in the first video, it's not perfectly complete. It is kind of in a state of flux. If you go to set up a brand new object, like this one, let's say, um, it should tell you setup is incomplete, and then you should be able to hit this button and it should create everything for you. So it's gonna generate this, uh, this color converter. It's gonna give you all of these channels to use on your color attributes. It's gonna set them all up as face corner uh, bike colors. And it also should apply the Uber shader. The only thing you need to do manually is set this color output here on the geometry node to color. I haven't figured out how inside the Blender, you know, Python add-on to set this, you know, automatically. So that's, that's a little bit annoying. So we go to color, pick a color and then paint, right? And then exactly like I showed you before, you can select certain faces, change the color and hit paint. And that's, that's kind of the gist of it. And so for trim sheets, normally what we do is like all of the polygons will be mapped to you know a single pixel meaning that they all you pick somewhere on the normal map here that's kind of flat right you don't want to pick an angled surface it's going to curve the entire mesh actually so you pick somewhere flat and that's where everything sits and what you do is you go face by face and kind of unwrap them to get some edge detail so if you wanted to put some edge detail on the back face you could select these two and then you could unwrap them and trim sheeting is like it is very much an artist thing i'm, I'm not going to claim to be good at it or anything like that you know, you, there's different ways of doing it. Uh, and maybe we decide we don't want to map this one at all. So we can actually just take all those points and scale them to zero and make sure you put them somewhere flat. And you'll notice you don't have a seam there or anything. So trim sheets are pretty powerful. They allow you to put in these kind of details just by shifting around UVs. When we're looking at our UV map, we need to make sure, first of all, we have the map UVs clicked. So when it's in object mode, click map UVs. And then we take a look at our UV map. You might not see anything, so don't let that alarm you. It just means that all those UV islands have been shifted by those discrete UDIM tiles, right? So once again, along the X-axis, this is going to map to your color palette. You can have as many colors as you want, 
and then the vertical axis is going to map to your metal roughness pair value. You can pick as many different metal uh, material types or plastic material types and different colors in your palette and you can just fill it out. It'll keep just moving these islands further and further. If you hit restore UVs, that will actually bring the UV map completely back into view, um, which is kind of nice. If things get messed up, you can come back here and say, okay, this is what the original UV map was. Um, and of course you can go back to map UVs. It's, it's interesting actually how it's a completely non-destructive process. And the reason is, is that when they get shifted by the, the discrete units, all we do is we floor the value. So let's say this polygon, let's say that first corner is like 2.2 .2 or something. All we do is we floor it. So we say the floor of 2.2 .2 is two, and then we subtract it from 2.2. .2, so we're left with 0.2, which is like the real, I'm using air quotes, you can't see me, but the real UV coordinate. Um, so we can always get back the original UV map and we can always remap them back to their, their UDIM tiles. So once that's all done, you're basically ready to export into Godot. Um, there's this prep for export and it only does two things. It removes the material and it applies the, the geometry node. So you can hit prep for export. It just kind of clears the state of it. You can get this back, but by hitting the restore button. But the annoying thing is that once again, this output color you do have to select here. So let's go ahead and prep for export. If we hit F3 and export GLTF, I'll show you these settings. I think I finally have them figured out and what we need. Uh, I'm just gonna limit to visible in case there's anything else in the scene. I don't think there is, but also we need data mesh. And then if we go to vertex colors, these settings should be okay. I think we don't need all vertex colors. We just need one. Um, and in fact, I'm going to double check this. Yeah, you want your color vertex color to be selected. I probably should add this to the prep for export button. So I'm going to add that to my backlog. So once that exports, you get your GLTF file. Um, there's no import pipeline or anything here. There's nothing special about Godot in this case. You could use other engines to, to do this. And the shader is actually really simple. But we're going to drag this in. You'll see it looks kind of weird. This is actually good, though, because we know that this is our color data that we want, the baked color data. Uh, we can make it editable, click on our cube, and then we're going to do a surface material override. Then we can quick load the Uber shader. It already has the trim sheet and the scratches built in. Okay, so, so far, those are the only two texture atlases that we're using. Um, and the idea with a shader like this is that you try to keep that to a minimum. And so you can see it comes in pretty good. Um, there's still some work that needs to be done. I haven't done bump mapping yet. So you'll notice if you look closely at the Blender file, you'll see there's like some nice scratch detail on the surface of kind of these curved surfaces, which is reasonably accurate, right? Anything that's got like kind of a curved surface is gonna have a little bit of bumpiness to the scratch. Um, it's kind of a negative bump value actually, so it's kind of like scratched into the surface. So I haven't implemented that in Godot yet. The shader itself is quite simple. Um, I will show you how to generate these color and metal. These are the palettes, right? So there's a utility on the Blender side to do that. But really, it's just a spatial shader, a couple of textures for your trim sheet and your scratches. Then there's palettes, uh, the color palette, the metal roughness pair palette. We have a scratch color, so that gets mixed in when we when we use the scratch on the on the color part of the, the albedo part of it. We look at UV2. Coming back to Blender, we see that UV2 is this UV map here. Um, and we know that these guys are shifted, right? So they're shifted by increments in the X for color and then increments in the Y for metal roughness pairs. So if we floor the X value, that gives us our index on our colors. Uh, if we floor the Y value of UV2, that gives us our index on our metal roughness, basically our material parameters, right? So then we plug in the R and the G from the metal roughness to, to the metallic and roughness channels. And we grab the edge mask from the, the green channel. Our edge mask gets mapped into green, so that makes sense. And then we actually sample the scratches texture based on UV2. I am doing a bit of scaling here. Um, that's maybe a number you could expose as a uniform. It's totally up to you. And then we multiply that texture by that edge mask, right? So wherever the mask is zero, that just totally gets blocked out. Wherever the mask is, you know, higher than zero, some value, that's where we mix it in. So that's how the edge masking comes in. And then we mix the color that we grabbed from the color palette with the scratch color based on the edge scratch mask. Um, so hopefully all that makes sense. Of course, we do have ambient occlusion here as well. I'll maybe just turn it off to show you what it looks like without it, right? So that's no ambient occlusion and then AO. Seems to work pretty good. I think this, this would be some areas you would see some self-shadowing. So that seems reasonably realistic to me. 
And then of course, the only problem now is that the normal map is only pulling from the trim sheet currently. Um, we're not doing any mixing from the scratches on the surface. I'm not gonna walk through the Python add-on code. Um, like I said, this is all open source. Feel free to contribute. I am personally super excited by this. I just, I don't know. I think I like pipelines. I like the tech art side of things. And uh, I would love to hear what other people think. And if we can get some collaboration on this, I would be, uh, I would be thrilled about that. So thanks again for watching and I'll catch you next time.